a lot of the understanding of statistics really began in actuary science or trying to figure out how to run insurance and make money. Uh, in fact, a lot of mathematics comes out of how to make money. So I threw in a few slides about that. I thought this was interesting because uh, talking about the witnesses to the JFK assassination were bad insurance risks because they all ended up dead. This is a guy known for gonzo journalism from Louisville, Kentucky, named Hunter Thompson, it was over the top. And he wrote a pretty freestyle. Uh, that was one of his commentaries. He wrote about gambling. He lived on the edge and asked questions about risk. And risk is a big part of what drives uh, study of statistics and probability. Uh, risk assessment and uh, risk tolerance or risk aversion. Uh, true gambling, in my opinion, is when there's no real assessment of risk. I thought this was a nice little anonymous poem. There was a movie called The Man Who Never Was from years ago that sort of fit it. And talking about taking risks, there was a saying that's been attributed to a lot of people, but uh, was uh, pinned down to Frank Scully uh, about go out on the limb, the fruit's out at the end. So take some chances or you don't get anywhere. And I found a point about uh, Hercules and his servant, Lycus, playing at dice. Hercules, for all his strength, could easily lose a throw of the dice because fortune doesn't uh, necessarily reflect any one thing, even strength. And there's a lot of uh, someone's yawning already. <laughs> uh, legend about gambling and like the dead man's hand, aces and eights that uh, were dealt Wild Bill Hickok before he was shot in the back. And uh, there's a lot of criminality associated with gambling. So people that go into that often have a sketchy quality. You might not believe that. I found this, it was kind of interesting, kind of going into my regular time here, so I need to hurry, but uh, I thought uh, a cool sign, only in Texas liquor gambling smokes and God in one location. So this was just a collage and now I'm going to launch. This is what I wanted to cover in this talk, and I'll let you read it, but I really want to emphasize a few points. I want to uh, help you think about risk versus security, certainty versus uncertainty, and how you can deal with that, how you can take limited information and come to a pretty good conclusion about where the center of all that is, what, what the thing you're looking for really is. Um, binomial theorem is a really, really big part of mathematics and combinatorics, of course, and I'm gonna talk about that. And binomial theorem leads to the normal distribution. I want you to end up associating the two. The normal distribution is born out of the binomial uh, distribution. Also, I want to ex uh, emphasize the idea of expectation. Now, that was uh, 
kind of confusing and used intuitively uh, for a long time, but expectation is a generalized mathematical concept. And what we would call the first moment expectation is the mean of a distribution. And then got a couple of cool theorems by Russians leading to an easy proof of uh, Jakob Bernoulli's uh, law of large numbers. The weak version is what I'm going to talk about. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about Gaussian distributions. Statistics, I think, is uh, interestingly uh, duplicitous or two-faced or stands on two legs or any way you want to look at it. Uh, I think that the uh, Roman god Janus uh, represents it pretty well. You have the old face looking into the past, and the young face looking into the future. And I think of the old face looking into the past as sort of statistics and the young face looking to the future as the probability of potential opportunities. Also, the other aspect of probability and statistics is uh, that it combines uh, uh, computational mathematics and theoretical mathematics in a way that's found really nowhere else in mathematics that I can think of. So, just a quick uh, listing of, st of uh, some definitions that you can look at and uh, that what statistics is. Um, one of the important aspects of statistics is you take statistical samples and try to figure out what's going on with a larger population. You try to take them randomly or stochastic uh, sampling. And uh, it's economical. It's the idea of it's to save money. You can't study the entire population of anything unless it's very limited uh, with efficiency. So by uh, taking a sample and having tools to analyze it, you can do it efficiently and effectively without using all your resources. That's how you can learn about a large universe with just a grain of sand. This little uh, quote at the end by Stalin, uh, I wanted to uh, counter by uh, uh, showing a picture of uh, Komokov, uh, who was an outstanding mathematician of the uh, 20th century. He put statistics on a rigorous basis. Really brilliant guy based in Moscow most of his career, I think. So we talk about populations, and populations, we're talking about something that is out there. We're just taking little bits of it, atoms of, of a gas, or uh, a scoop of uh, grain, or whatever small part of a whole that you want to study. You have some defined procedure, one of the aspects of statistics that came out around 1950 and on from Fisher, uh, whose name you might have heard, uh, was the, a defined algorithmic approach to experimentation. And any more with um, interdisciplinary approaches to uh, uh, experiments. Uh, statisticians uh, are a good thing to have on board. Uh, so I, and I mentioned uh, you want to have uh, economical uh, thoughts about this. You usually um, might have grants or a certain uh, uh, budget you have to follow. So you have to have su uh, samples that are subsets of manageable sizes. Uh, I want to talk real quickly about some numbers. One is pi. Where does pi come from? Well, you have similar geometric figures. You have a, uh, S1 is a small arc and S2 is a larger arc centered at the crossing of these two lines. And 
you can create a, a, a proportionality. Well, the same proportionality really will work for the entire circle. The uh, entire circle uh, is the full arc all the way around 360 degrees or whatever. And uh, so the circumference of the circle to the radius is a constant. And that constant's what we call pi. Now, let me see here, let's see. I, um, I'll just say you can you can estimate pi. You can you, there are, you can take chords, which are the if you look at the arc uh, between uh, uh, for for that C one, uh, it's a short little arc, uh, and the chord between the two points where the uh, the radii hit the uh, arc. Uh, make a short line segment, which is very close in size to the arc. The smaller the arc, the more uh, similar it is in size to the uh, chord. So if you subdivide a circle into n segments like this, then um, you can figure the length of the chords. There's a easy way to do that, you know, uh, you have side angle side determines a triangle and uh, the squares of the radii, two times the radius squared times uh, uh, the uh, um, cosine of the angle between them is the equal, equal to the uh, chord. You can actually do computational uh, methods to estimate pi. That's another thing I want to uh, encourage people to do in this. But before I talk about that, uh, I want to encourage people of any age, get a compass, get a straight edge, and see what you can do. Um, uh, Archimedes was at least 76 when uh, he was uh, slaughtered by uh, Romans, and he was drawing figures in the sand. It's uh, uh, not just for kids, uh, and it, uh, you kind of learn things by doing this. Um, if you take a circle, uh, there's one, one thing I think is really curious is that you have this uh, area of a circle has a constant as well. That same constant is used for the circumference of the circle. How did this happen? If, on the surface of it, that doesn't necessarily have to happen, but if you take a circle like I had on this uh, tabletop and cut sectors, bisect them and align them in opposite ways, you can create uh, a finer and finer subdivision that becomes more squared or rectangular. And if uh, you look at the lower right there, uh, each uh, side is the length of the radius and the uh, little arcs on each end total half the circumference. So that uh, if, uh, uh, well, by one side being related to the circumference, you can see that pi would be related to the area of the circle that's being geometrically squared, when you take that to a limit, you'll be cutting molecules eventually with your scissors. But uh, Kepler was uh, the first, as far as I understand, who did that. Um, there's a famous problem I want to talk about that leads into some of this, and this was Bernoulli's problem of compound interest. And just to review this real quickly, if you have uh, whatever your interest is that uh, you're making on an investment, um, uh, you add it to one and multiply it times your basis and you'll get however much uh, the uh, um, amount is going to be uh, or grow to by whatever the interest period is. Uh, if you invest your money wisely, put one euro in 
a bank and get 3% interest, all you have to do is wait until June 13th of the 23rd year, if you put it in on January 1st, and your euro will become two euros. So what are you gonna do with all that money? In any case, uh, this equation here of uh, one plus the interest to the nth power is what we're interested in. Bernoulli asked uh, if you have, for whatever period, the uh, principal double, what happens if you compound it at half period or a fourth period? Um, and you uh, can come up with the uh, question, what happens if you did that an infinite number of times? You start to look at the limit of one plus one over n to the nth power. And if you go to Google and you type graph, and you don't have to type four, but uh, it will state what the graph is at the top. You type in the uh, search line uh, graph and the equation. You don't have to write Y or anything, uh, but um, some equation of, of X, and it wants to have it in uh, the uh, um, um, uh, terms of X, it will give you a graph. Now for this particular equation, it's sort of problematic. It's, as you look in the lower right-hand corner there, it kind of fluctuates all over the place. But if you, uh, you can crunch with uh, your numbers uh, in Google and have it calculate for 10,000 or a million or whatever, and it will give you numbers closer and closer to this long number, which I think isn't so hard to remember, 2.7, 1828, 1828, and then 45, 90, 45, 23, kind of 45, 90, is one that's double the other, and then back to 45, and 23 is about half 45. So I, I find it easy to remember to that point, and that's as far as I want to bother. Uh, you might want to internalize this. This number is as important in mathematics as pi. And, you know, someone mentioned, um, I have difficulty with the name, uh, the uh, mathematician in India who uh, uh, wrote about pi, and he estimated pi as the square root of 10. Uh, something popped in my head one day, this uh, E, is um, approximated pretty nicely within 1% or so by the square root, the cube root of 20. Uh, that's kind of a fun fact if you're on a desert island or looking, sitting in a prison cell or something. <laughs> any rate, there's a way of doing this when you use the power of your laptop for number crunching or graphing if you change this around, this limit doesn't care if n is going toward infinity or zero. It, it, it cares if that argument of one over n or n is uh, getting larger or smaller. So you can switch this around and substitute one over x for n, and you get this. You can take the limit of one plus x to the one x exponent. And if you graph that, it's a little easier. Um, you change the limit it goes to, as it goes toward zero. And looking at the graph, um, now this is, a, this is computational mathematics. This is not, you know, uh, which everything just about comes down to in some way, but uh, it, it's a little different uh, in a way of expressing or discovering what E is about. But if you look at it there, where it crosses the y-axis uh, at uh, x equals zero, of course, one over zero doesn't exist, but the limit does, and that's E, the number E, named for Euler. Now, I don't want to... I, I, I figured this um, is uh, largely a group of people that are involved in education and teaching. 
And for mathematics, uh, much of uh, what people learn is taught to them by um, maybe non-mathematicians, scientists, uh, people with mathematical skills. Uh, but uh, uh, originally I learned uh, a significant uh, part of uh, statistics from a chemistry professor. Um, that's not where you want to stop, but, uh, and if you do that, uh, you often will end up with bits and pieces and uh, need to work at putting, putting it together. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to write this out for a couple reasons. I wanted to let you look at it. Just uh, these are really critical concepts. Being uh, fluent or uh, comfortable with exponents and logarithms in uh, the mathematics of involving statistics uh, is, is critical. And I want to point out the cool thing about these kinds of equations. If you're dealing with uh, uh, functions, you're trying to do some kind of functional analysis and you're dealing with functions that are multiplied together and you want to separate out those variables. Uh, you may be a one function of X and another of Y and X and Y are independent. Uh, if you take the logarithm or a logarithm of the multiple, it becomes the sum of the logarithms and you can do an inverse transform uh, back to an, and take the exponential function of that, get it back into its, uh, something like its original form if you need to. Um, so it converts multiplication to addition and that helps you pry apart problems once you identify what you're trying to figure out about a, a system and set up a problem or model to create a, a, uh, an equation to derive, you can often use this uh, to uh, derive it. I wanted also to um, talk a little bit about the exponent or the um, uh, exponential function and its derivative. If you look at this, the important thing I want to emphasize here is that the exponential function of whatever base is always equal to itself times a limit. And uh, that limit's kind of uh, curious, interesting. Uh, let's look a little further. You can uh, use graphing functions to estimate limits on this sort of thing as well. And in this, I'm doing, this is an important point really, doing a function with exponent, uh, with the, the base is E, um, Euler's number. And at zero, that is, a, I got a touch screen here. Uh, at zero, um, it's equal to one. That limit's equal to one. So the derivative of the exponential function is equal to the exponential function. It is unique in that way. It's extraordinarily useful in that way. Um, for one thing, uh, there are tricks like you develop moments, what are called moments in uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, statistical functions where you uh, take the derivative of e to the, or exponent of tx and with respect to t, and that will be, and then set it equal to, um, um, set uh, t equal to zero for the derivative, and that will give you x it's uh, uh, something I want to mention. It's uh, more than I can get into in, a, uh, in depth in this discussion, but uh, uh, I wanted you to be aware of moments. I'm going to mention it again later. Um, let's look at the logarithm uh, derivative. And this will come full circle here a little bit. Uh, if you take the logarithm derivative, you come up with the log 
uh, the derivative of log is of any base is one over x times. So that's that's important and remember, of course, and times a limit. Uh, keep touching my screen. Uh, the limit here should look familiar to you. A little bit ago, we did a limit of one plus x to the x, and it was equal to e. That basically is e. So you have the logarithm of whatever base to the number e, of the number e, which is 2.7, 1828, 1828, 4590, 4523. Okay, if that happens to be to the base e, e to, um, the exponent uh, or the logarithm of e to the base e is one. So you end up with that limit becoming inconsequential and in taking the derivative. So this is one reason why we use exponential functions because the derivative of the exponential function is equal to itself and we use uh, natural logs because the derivative of natural logs is x, it is one over x. And of course, they're inverse functions, just like uh, when uh, you have um, uh, linear equations, y equals mx, um, and uh, the uh, slope of x uh, equals something of y is 1 over m. You, the uh, slope of the uh, uh, of the uh, reciprocal of the natural log is related to the exponential function slope uh, or, or derivative. In other words, the derivative of an inverse function is the reciprocal of it. Uh, okay, here's a picture of Euler. I have a collection of some of these lithographs I took pictures of. And, uh, uh, Euler was blind in one eye, spent most of his career in St. Petersburg, and uh, he was probably the most prolific uh, mathematician uh, in history, but he uh, 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 was not so rigorous. Uh, if you do um, uh, an application of binomial theorem, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, to this log, uh, uh, to this x, this one plus uh, uh, delta x over x to the x over delta x, you will come up with uh, this expression of, I keep hitting the screen, sorry, uh, this expression of uh, E in an infinite series. Uh, uh, you can also get that by simply uh, deriving um, the uh, Maclaurin series for exponent of x and setting x equal to zero. Um, I thought this might be uh, helpful for a couple reasons. One, it emphasizes how you can explore uh, some of these functions you might have forgotten that you have heard of before or uh, that you wonder about by uh, going to Google and type in log x comma natural log of x comma and x minus one and x and the green line is x, it's color coded. Uh, the orange is x minus one and uh, the uh, natural log is the red line that I should use a pen or something to meet with. I want to emphasize a couple of things. I know you can't see my pen, but um, anyway, the upper left-hand corner on the graph is uh, a way of expanding the whole graph. You click on plus or minus above and below the crosshairs there or to the side there, you click on it, it'll show you vertical or horizontal axis separately and let you expand uh, either axis. And I think for teaching, 
um, are just used to explore mathematics for any age. This is really incredible to me. I, uh, I don't want to say how long I've been doing this, but uh, I will say that uh, people like uh, uh, Euler, he was uh, able to do these series in his head to uh, go out a great uh, many terms to get uh, an estimate. He could look at a thing for a moment and know if it was diverging or uh, converging. And uh, now you can just do it in a, in a um, computer. So uh, you've been Eulerized. One, one other point besides uh, encouragement to use this graph function in Google, which I just happened to come across, and I hadn't come across anyone else that knew about it. Uh, so I wanted to emphasize it to you folks. Uh, is if you look at the red curve, which is the natural log, and the orange curve, which is x minus one, so I just placed the green line over by one, it's at a tangent there. And uh, the natural log, the derivative of the natural log uh, is one over x, and at one, one over x is one, so the slope to a tangent at, of the curve at, um, uh, x equals one should uh, be, uh, or a straight line, uh, you know, approximating it uh, at that point should have the slope one. You see it does. I think it's really important to, um, uh, I'm tapping, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I would, I'm hit my computer with a, using a pen <laughs> with a, uh, and tapped on the screen. I um, apologize for the noise. At any rate, uh, I think getting uh, a sense of uh, real life experience with what happens with functions, you can't break these suckers. You can do whatever you want to them. You won't increase the carbon footprint. You won't hurt the world. You won't kill animals. No animals were injured or harmed in the making of this presentation. Uh, you can do all this stuff pretty safely. It's pretty, quite economical for your own budget as well. So at any rate, uh, here again, I just wanted to show these inverse functions. Now I better pick up speed. This is... Uh, Pascal, he's on my wall in my dining room. Uh, it's one of my collection. Uh, he was uh, something of a father to probability theory uh, in the early points of it. And here's Pascal's triangle, which actually goes back to ancient times, at least to ancient Persia. Uh, if you look at this triangle, any number is equal to the sum of the two numbers just above it. And uh, what I would encourage, uh, you look at each row as the first row is zero, the second row is one, the third, the third row we'll call two, and so forth. You number the rows from zero, and you number the items zero and one for the row one and uh, uh, number across from zero up and number down from zero up, if that makes sense. Um, I don't, you can't see my cursor on my computer, can you? I'm sure you can't. Um, any rate, uh, what you imagine if uh, well, take the number four there. Uh, that's for the fifth, that's for n equals five, and that's for k equals two. K being uh, this, I'm sorry, k equals one. So it's the uh, fifth row, first term. Uh, one is the zeroth term. This relates to combinatorics. And uh, so the four, is uh, uh, basically uh, would be written uh, uh, five um, uh, items combined uh, uh, 
let's see if I'm saying this right. No. Um, yeah, um, zero one. Um, And I'm just taking uh, k time, uh, combined in k, n items combined in k ways, uh, k at a time. Um, okay, zero, one. Okay, find uh, five items combined one at a time. I think it would be five. I'm going to go on. I'm getting myself confused. Uh, my point, uh, though, was uh, that um, if you are looking for the um, combinations, of anything, it would be all the combinations uh, taken at the, uh, 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 the combinations of n things taken uh, k times uh, at, without concern for order would be the same as the combinations uh, for n minus one times taken k uh, uh, at a time plus the n minus one uh, items taken k minus one at a time, because each of those ones that are taken k minus one at a time get get a new one when the, you go to the next row. Anyway, I've uh, twisted my tongue here somehow. Any, I'm gonna go on though, because I gotta cover some stuff here. Pascal's triangle, I took uh, um, Excel and graphed it and this is, a, I think, an important slide for you. If you look at this, does anyone uh, notice anything about the shape of that curve of uh, plotting out uh, Pascal's triangle as those numbers get larger? Those curves become more and more like a normal bell-shaped curve. Pascal's triangle is the spine of the normal distribution, in a sense. There was a Abraham de Moivre who uh, was the first to recognize that uh, a normal distribution uh, could be uh, used to approximate uh, a binomial distribution, especially when you get into larger numbers. And uh, it's tedious uh, to work with binomial distributions. So if you get into, because you look at the coefficients, uh, uh, I had meant to uh, talk about uh, n factorial here. Uh, n factorial is equal to itself times every number less than itself. Uh, down to one and zero factorial and one factorial or one. Uh, those get to be really large numbers to deal with. If you're working with pen and pencil, that's going to be a lot of work and uh, take down a lot of trees. So using um, uh, a, a technique for approximating binomial distribution with normal uh, distributions uh, becomes quite useful uh, if you need to do that. Uh, also, just I uh, wanted to emphasize this again in functional analysis. If you look at, uh, take the logarithm of n factorial, you break that product up into sums. And if you consider instead of n, you kind of imagine it on uh, a, um, a graph instead of n, think of x, and um, do it as though you're uh, doing an integral of the logarithm of x, that's solvable. And that is a little direction for you in how you can derive what's called Stirling's approximation. Again, de Moivre uh, was the first to come up with that, although uh, Stirling improved on the um, um, uh, constant, and he was uh, English, so uh, it was named after him. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
De Moivre was quite interesting. He was a Huguenot. He had to flee. He was put in prison for a while. He never married. He was a bright guy. He uh, uh, had to leave uh, France because of the persecution of uh, Huguenots, uh, the Protestants, French Protestants. And he went uh, to... Uh, no, De Mavre was uh, uh, French, uh, and um, uh, he went to London, and he uh, uh, studied all the time. He did tutoring of wealthy people. Someone actually gave him uh, Principia that Newton had published, and he would uh, take pages, tear pages out and read them as he was going to his next job tutoring. And uh, I heard that, it, it just broke my heart to think of the book being destroyed. But that was the only way he would study it page by page. And he found it to be much deeper than the other books he had read. Uh, uh, in any case, uh, there was a story also that Newton had people come up to him, much the way Brahms would have people come up and want to show their scores that they'd come up with, and he would see musical cliches in them uh, just by looking at the score. Newton would have people come to him at all kinds of times wanting to look at some problem that they had worked on. And he uh, was uh, sup supposedly quoted as saying, uh, you might want us to talk to De Mavre about that. Uh, he knows more about these things than I do. So, This is a, a graph of the uh, Stirling equation uh, where I put uh, X instead of N just to show how fast that grows. Okay. And if you uh, change the scale, uh, this is for uh, the X axis spread out pretty uh, wide. So you're seeing just uh, N factorial estimated at low numbers. If you go to a um, higher scale, uh, look at that caveman go. Okay. Flies. All right. Permutations. I want to just point out one thing about permutations. And you can look at this kind of a... Uh, graph you probably or table you've probably seen before about how you get uh, uh, um, uh, a um, formula for uh, permutations of n things taken k times. Uh, uh, that is related to the uh, binomial uh, theorem. This is the coefficient for binomial theorem. And if you look at the uh, n factorial over n minus 1 factorial there, that's permutations. Of course, you have many more permutations than combinations, because combinations don't care about order, and, and the permutations are ordered sets. So uh, how many more? k factorial more. So I thought that was rather interesting. And uh, Newton, during the plague, came up with a uh, uh, a uh, generalized uh, binomial theorem, uh, which I wrote there at the bottom, which uh, has these uh, equations. But at any rate, uh, if you uh, 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 exp expand the uh, uh, permutation uh, uh, thing, and Newton's um, Newton's uh, co uh, uh, numerator is equal to this version of the uh, permutation number. And the net works for, uh, hmm, here we are. That works for uh, uh, using binomial theorem to uh, do almost any kind of rational exponent. Okay, so I don't want to dwell on this too much here. Um, just showing the uh, expansion of the uh, binomial theorem. This is a Hubachian uh, lithograph from about 1729. It's on my dining room wall uh, that I share with you. Uh, uh, 
And that's Isaac Newton, of course. Okay, a few definitions. Uh, experiment, you make observations, want one and only one outcome, and uh, When you do an experiment, you're uh, taking samples from uh, that correspond to points in a sample or outcome space. And uh, there are different ways of talking about this. I, I, I wanted to point out also this, uh, uh, the two dots and equal sign is uh, one way in mathematics that people use uh, to say is equivalent to or uh, uh, defined as. So it's a kind of shorthand if you ever see that. Uh, discrete sample spaces are the easier to talk about. Uh, uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, I'll let you read this as I talk. Uh, but when you have a discrete sample space, all these uh, finite points at uh, uh, or countable infinity, which means that you can put them in one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers one, two, three, and so forth. Uh, events, uh, an event is any subset of a set. Now, if, especially if you get into the continuous numbers, uh, if you talk about uh, all the subsets of the real numbers, you're talking about sets of cardinality that are greater than the real numbers. In other words, there are different levels of infinity. The real numbers have an infinity that's infinitely more than the infinity of the natural numbers. So you have to be careful with the definitions and terms in these or else you'll get into the same trouble that set theory got into. Now, what, like with Bertrand Russell's paradox, which is equivalent to if God is all powerful, can he invent or create an object that's too large for him to move? So you have simple events, single sample point, and uh, all right, I threw this in just for a laugh. Well, <laughs> if you feel this way at this point, sorry. This took me right. Um, here's one point uh, I wanted to really emphasize. Expectation is a term that's used a lot in statistics. And they talk about ex expectation if you're, you, I, I haven't really defined it yet mathematically, but uh, let me point out if when, when it's applied to, um, uh, the average or mean or I, and there are a whole bunch of different uh, estimates of central tendency and distributions um, usually you use the average um, that is uh, uh, the uh, what's called the first moment which I'll mention again there I'm not going to talk a lot about moments but it's the expectation of a sample, and that's totally linear, uh, meaning that if you multiply something times it, you can take the constant out of the expecta expectation, and if you are adding two random variables, the expectation is equal to some of those two. Uh, I think that you need to play with this stuff to really start thinking of it in terms of expectations rather than, uh, it's almost like algebra of, um, of samples. Uh, hmm, I don't know how I got this far down here. Seem to. I, I, uh, I thought I'd open just slides that uh, I'm not seeing.
Okay, well, I'm gonna go with the flow here. Uh, the weak law of large numbers was worked on supposedly for about 20 years by Jakob Bernoulli, uh, or Jacob Bernoulli, and um, uh, who was a Swiss mathematician and uh, physicist. And uh, I can believe it probably took him 20 years. There were a lot of uh, points that were confusing to people about uh, probability when this all started. And he, he was really looking at coin toss. Uh, but uh, the idea of it is when you um, have uh, a sample, you get an average. Uh, there's no guarantee it's going to be um, the average of the big picture, the average of the population. But uh, as you take bigger and bigger samples or more and more samples, it will start to uh, average out. You'll start to get um, the true mean. And he actually proved it. Um, I, you take a bunch of independent variables, you can add them together and make another independent variable like this. And uh, for some reason, a whole slew of my slides disappeared. Uh, so I'm not going to get into the details. There's a point about variance. Variance is equal to the expectation of the difference between uh, each independent variable and the mean squared. It's, it's, it's not linear like the average is. Uh, so if you uh, um, have uh, the variance of, um, um, of um, these uh, independent variables all being uh, uh, sigma squared, and you take uh, 1 over n, uh, that 1 over n becomes n squared there. Um, uh, this is terrible. I wish I had the slide created to show the basis of that. But uh, it's a tricky part of this proof that uh, uh, lets you end up with uh, this um, equation at the lower left-hand corner, which is based, whoa. I'm waiting for this to res now. I'm sorry. This is really all over the place. Well, I, I'm going to just wing it here. Here's the idea of how the law, a weak law of large numbers was uh, can be proven. You have a, a theorem called Markov's inequality, and it works for any, um, any distribution. And um, it basically states that uh, the chance in, in, in a distribution, if the chance of uh, uh, a value being uh, an outlier or greater than some value A is uh, uh, less than whatever the average is or expectation for that uh, um, uh, sample space, divided by A. And that's really um, beautiful. Now, that only applies to positive uh, distributions where there are no negative uh, 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 data points. Um, if you apply Markov's inequality to Chebyshev's, uh, uh, or I'm, I'm saying this odd, uh, to get Chebyshev's inequality, you apply Markov's inequality to variance, and you can show that the variance um, is uh, uh, that basically it puts bounds on the difference between 
uh, any any x in your sample and uh, the um, the mean and you take that and then you can prove uh, the uh, weak law of large numbers by uh, based on a limit um, see if I can get back a little bit here I'm running short on time and I wanted to leave a few minutes for questions if you had them Something funky happened to my slides here. I don't know. They, I went through them last evening and they were all in order. Thank you, Dave. But uh, see if I can get anything. Okay, okay. Uh, here are some. Maybe I can still teach another point. I, I hope this is getting through. By the way, uh, if you saw a picture of Prince here, that was a joke. I was going to talk about the Prince of Mathematics, which is Gauss. Yeah, they were all numbered properly last evening. And I looked and I thought they were there. I added a few at the end that were also numbered right. But, uh, well. I created this uh, scatter graph using Excel. I just made up numbers. It was like bad science. And um, if you look at this, this is like what you're trying to uh, uh, what you're trying to uh, uh, figure uh, is is the mean. And there's a normal distribution embedded in this. It's like trying to measure the position of a star. And uh, there are derivations. Gauss really was the first one to uh, get a good uh, breakdown of this. Uh, and there are, are cool uh, ways to derive the Gaussian distribution that were done by uh, Maxwell and Herschel and others. Uh, uh, in any rate, uh, a couple of points. The, um, there's symmetry, radial symmetry. It's, if you look at any point around the origin, uh, 180 degrees from it uh, should have the same uh, uh, likelihood of having a point. So uh, you also have X and Y, and they should be independent variables. And of course, the radius uh, to any X or Y point is the square root of the sum of the squares. But you need to s separate these out somehow. Now, I wanted to point out, if you just play with equations on, on Google Graph, like 1 over x, well, that has a curve to it. If you could switch it around somehow, maybe that would work. But no, that's not too good. For one thing, it doesn't, ha it has a discontinuity at 0. You look at this other ways of how can you get rid of this square root of x squared plus y squared. You need to get rid of the radical. Uh, maybe you can square x squared, put it in 1 over x squared. That gets rid of the radical, but that still is, is this hyperbolic uh, sort of configuration. And it goes to asymptotes. Uh, so that's that's clearly not going to get you what you want in terms of the shape of a function. And here, what if you just take the exponent of x squared? That flies high in the air on each side pretty quickly and it doesn't graph very well. Well, what if you do this? You know, with uh, if you got to go through x equals zero, and you're dealing with uh, reciprocals, 
one way to deal with that is to make um, it an exponent to the negative x, because the negative exponent makes uh, e in the denominator. And um, so negative x, and then you also have x squared, and you get a curve that looks like this. So it looks quite a lot like those little ribs on the growing Pascal triangle that I um, mapped out on, through Excel, if you can see that just intuitively. So I'd like you to remember is that for the Gaussian distribution, the exponent to the negative x squared is fundamental to its uh, setup. The other thing is, if you've got uh, x squared plus y squared, you want to separate them, you've got exponents, you look up the upper left-hand corner here, you can turn it into e, e to the y, it's supposed to be e to the x times e to the y. It's good it's not a book. Or right, here we go, like this. So I want you to remember that the shape of the normal distribution relates to exponent of negative x squared. And here is um, the equation for it uh, all worked out. Uh, once you set up constraints about symmetry and how the uh, um, variables act, you can come up, you can come up with uh, a problem to solve, which is not easy to demonstrate. Uh, it's multivariate. Uh, integration, so it comes out to this equation. But you notice you have your uh, x minus mu, which is mu is the average squared, and by putting it over whatever the uh, standard de uh, the uh, standard deviation squared or variance uh, there, uh, it um, normalizes it. In other words, if you take this and plot it as a distribution and figure the um, variance of it, the variance will be one. And it will be centered because every x, doesn't matter what uh, equation you start with, every x would be uh, subtracting the mean. So the mean of the transformed one is in the center, it's zero. Uh, and uh, you can uh, substitute um, z, uh, is equal to your variable minus the mean over your standard deviation, uh, and um, uh, you'll come out with a, a useful equation that can be integrated to get you the area under the curve. And this is the form you go, you put your data in this form, you go to your tables, and you can extract what you need. Finally, I've just to mention, um, and I'll finish, the central limit theorem uh, is really very cool. It doesn't matter what kind of distribution you have. You can have any distribution and do experiments and try to determine the mean. And as you do uh, more and more experiments to determine the mean, the distribution of your plot of the means derived from each of those experiments is a normal distribution. That That's pretty stunning, really. And again, it doesn't matter what kind of distribution it is. There's one more aspect here I wanted to uh, 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 suggest you try to know the uh, empirical rule that uh, within one, uh, it's, it's really standard, within one standard deviation of uh, on either side of the mean, 68% of the data lies. The probability that uh, is 95% that any point of data will be within two standard deviations, and it's 99.7% within three standard deviations. So, 68, 95, 99.7, that's the empirical rule. That's worth remembering. 
So, okay, we're over three standard deviations from the origin here. Uh, I had created a, an equation uh, which was a, a polynomial, which uh, by setting roots equal to zero and one, it, it crossed the uh, x set x-axis at uh, x equals zero and one. And it had a skewed quality to it. And uh, uh, I was pleased to make it, and I normalized it. I took the area under the curve and divided it, uh, divided the polynomial by it so that if you integrated that polynomial between zero and one, it was equal to one. And that's, uh, one of the slides that got lost here was the axioms by which probability is defined. Uh, everything has a probability in your sample space of zero or greater. And the total uh, probability of all the uh, elements or, or uh, points in your sample space is one. So if you have a probability distribution curve, which uh, if it's discrete, you call it a probability mass uh, function, uh, it should total one. And uh, I'll give one last tip here. Uh, I, it was a great article I read recently is about David Hilbert, uh, uh, who died in 1943 in Germany. Um, he was, uh, uh, famous 20th century mathematician, and uh, his 19th um, problem he proposed, which was solved 10 years later, uh, related to, uh, you know, squares. If you look at variance, variance is equal to sums of squares. In this case, uh, uh, the square of each x minus the average. Uh, so it's got to be greater than zero. And he wondered if um, um, polynomials that are um, never negative are always sums of uh, squares of polynomials. You know, two polynomials squared would equal uh, the uh, original polynomial if you know it's positive everywhere. And that happens to be true. And that's being used uh, in um, driverless cars to uh, create um, uh, barriers for uh, 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 where the car should go and where it shouldn't go. It stays in the negative areas. Then it won't hit any of those uh, uh, positive polynomials. It's, uh, the trouble was it was too much uh, calculating even for computer. You know, with uh, uh, pencil and paper, you may think you can do a lot, and uh, you can you use a slide rule, and it helps you. Uh, if you've ever used a slide rule, if you get a calculator, uh, you can do quicker and uh, more precise calculations probably. And you got a computer, a laptop, you can do great things. But that expands your horizons, and at some point you realize that you're out at sea in a canoe. Your laptop is like a canoe, and you can have equations and problems that your laptop will never be able to get through. But this, uh, these two people um, uh, developed an algorithm uh, by which it's uh, sort of like fast Fourier transforms. They could work through this problem. But at any rate, there's a lot of mathematics about uh, squares and sums of squares and variance relates to that. And I had someone recently ask me why wouldn't you use, use uh, absolute value uh, for variance? And the reason is because it's not useful. It, you could, you can define anything any way you want and it'll come out any way you uh, um, can find relations. Uh, so, uh, uh, but with um, variance defined as the sums of squares of the difference between each sample value and uh, the mean, uh, it's, uh, um, uh, it works and it's useful and you can do a lot of mathematics with it. 
I'll say one other thing real quickly, especially with disc disc discrete um, problems like tossing a coin. Um, it's another thing I'd shown in the slides which got lost that um, the probability, if it's, if it's a fair coin, if chance of uh, hitting heads or calling it success and tails failure uh, would be 0.5 and the probability is 0.5. Well, you never have, you know, 0.5 isn't a choice. You, you toss a coin, you get a heads, that's one, that's a success and failure's a zero. And so the mean doesn't have to be part of the sample set as a point I wanted to make. And um, kind of related to that, I thought was the idea that uh, uh, half, uh, the, on the average, uh, human beings have one testicle or pretty close to it. Uh, the average doesn't have to actually be uh, uh, representative of the sample. So, uh, I put a PDF of my whole set of slides that uh, should have shown at this link that uh, people are welcome to use. And uh, I'm gonna post it right now, uh, along with the article of, about um, uh, Pilpert. I was reading something else this morning, uh, in 1934, David Hilbert was having uh, a meal with um, a man named Rust, uh, who was the Nazi Minister of Education. And so um, Rust asked uh, Hilbert, so how are things at Göttingen? Göttingen was the uh, top place uh, for mathematics in the world at the time. This is 1934, and uh, that's where Gauss had been. And uh, in any, any case, he says, so how are things at Göttingen now that we've eliminated the Jewish influence? And Hilbert said, there is no more mathematics at Göttingen. So education and uh, freedom of thought, and it doesn't belong to any ethnic group and it doesn't belong to any demographic, it's human. And it's a treasure. And it's one of the things that I think makes, it is redemption for humanity, which is other side, otherwise seems a pretty sorry lot. Uh, so I'll end with that. Any questions? I apologize, my slides got buggered up so badly, I don't know. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I wish everyone a good weekend. I appreciate that, Jess. It was, um, I think, an ambitious presentation, but uh, I thought I could fly through it. But remember, binomial theorem and normal distributions are related, and play with graphs, say graph, whatever, on Google search, and see what happens. That looks like a good probability of, that of having a good weekend. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here. I'm gonna turn my microphone off, I guess. Thank you. <laughs> I think you have a point.
Thank <laughs> you.